Okay, is anybody listening? Can I do something to make you really uncomfortable? Sure. Really? I got two people saying no. Y'all want to move forward? You want to move forward? You don't have to. If you're really entrenched in that spot, you don't have to, but... <laughs> then you're going to say, oh man, now it looks like the church is empty. Well, but where it's full, it's full. That's right. That's okay. We'll get together a little bit. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> then at least when we're singing together, it sounds like I can hear somebody standing behind me. I know it's not just me. <laughs> Let's just open with a word of prayer this morning. Father, I thank you for just for your joy. I thank you, God, that we can walk in peace. God, I know that there are folks that are out deer hunting this morning. And Lord, we pray for their safety. We all have friends and family, and they're out in the woods with guns, and they have people around them that have guns that we maybe don't know. God, we ask for your protection. <coughs> Lord, we ask that you would, um, you would bless our friends and family while they're out in the woods this weekend. God, I thank you for those who've already gotten deer. God, I thank you that we come and we, we get to bring a sacrifice of praise this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just, you would fill this place with your presence. We maybe aren't full of people, but we can be filled with your presence this mm -hmm. morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to share one thing. I want to share one thing before we get started. I have it actually as part of my notes, but I'm going to share it right now instead. We were in the back room here and we were praying for the service this morning and I thought, you know, we get together and how many of you know before people go out deer hunting, they get prepared. You ever, have you driven around this past week and seen orange clothes hanging on the lines outside before deer hunting? Mm -hmm. A week before deer hunting, guys will take their orange clothes and they'll hang them outside so it doesn't smell like perfume, it doesn't smell like soap, it doesn't smell like laundry soap. It smells like nature. <laughs> they do that. They prepare for it. They get their guns all ready. They go out a week in advance, maybe two weeks in advance, and they'll set up a little target 50 yards away, and they'll shoot at that little target. They'll do that all afternoon sometimes to make sure that they're prepared. And then you know what happens to us? We come to church, and we sit in the pews, and we go, oh, boy, there's only four of them, and look at, they're sitting. <coughs> We prepare more for a football game than we do when we come to church to worship the Lord. Uh-oh, you know you're that? meddling. You're meddling. We, I'm sorry. I don't mean to mess. Yes, I do. I mean to mess with people. We get jerseys and we buy wings and we get barbecue sauce and we do. And we, we don't make that much preparation to come and worship the Lord. You realize we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Everything that, that was created was created by God. Everything that you see around us. <coughs> I'm telling you folks this morning, we should stand up and say, Hallelujah. We should thank the Lord. We should be so ready to worship when we come on Sunday morning. It shouldn't make any difference if we have lights or guitars or music or, or drums or no. It just, we're, we should be here to worship the Lord. See, now I am meddling. I know it. I could sit down anytime, but I don't think I should. We should stand together this morning and worship the Lord. Amen? Amen? Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you for your grace. We worship you, God. We honor you. We respect you. We say you are worthy of glory and honor this morning, regardless of how we feel. You're worthy of glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Tim. Just as a word of uh, explanation, we're going to do things a little bit different than we're accustomed to this morning. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to introduce every song with a verse of scripture that's going to be on the, on the screen, and I'm asking everybody to read the scripture aloud together with us before we sing the song, okay? Does everybody understand that? So you don't have to hesitate. Don't wonder what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to read the scripture along with us, and Anna put the first one up there. What we're going to do right now to set the stage for the whole service is we're going to read through Revelation chapter 4. Verses 1 through 11. And as we read through it, I want you to, to seriously consider what it is that we're saying, okay? Because it's going to set your heart for the whole thing. Okay, let's read it together. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. 
And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. <clears throat> and immediately I was in the Spirit. I said, and immediately I was in the Let's all say it together. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders, sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings, and thunderings, and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's us, folks. God has created all things for his pleasure. And our prayer has been that God would be pleased with our worship this morning. Anna, put that first verse up there. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. I put that verse up there because we're going to sing several songs that have to do with lifting up hands. And I want to encourage you, when we come to that place, do it. We have come into this house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into this house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into this house, gathered in his name to worship Christ. Christ the Lord. So forget about yourself. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself and concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's lift up holy hands. Let us lift up holy hands. Magnify His name and worship Him. Let us lift up holy hands. Magnify His name. Christ the Lord. 
as I was considering how to proceed with this service this morning, I was reminded of the fact that Pastor Tim is doing a study on the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we read these words together with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The next verse, Anna. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Just leave it up there for a minute. As I was reading that, the word holy stood out to me. And holy is going to be the theme of our worship this morning. Holy. God has made us holy. And uh, this next song says, My glory and the lifter of my head. We got a God who lifts us up. And uh, this song goes like this. My glory and the lifter of my head. My glory and the lifter of my head. Oh, thou, oh Lord, art a shield to me. My glory and the lifter of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And he heard me out of his holy hill. My glory and the lifter of my head. Hallelujah, my glory and the lifter of my head. For thou, oh Lord, art a shield to me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And he heard me on his holy hill. My glory and the lifter of my head, hallelujah. My glory and the lifter of my head. Oh, thou, O Lord, art a shield to me. My glory and the lifter of my head. Amen, amen, amen. The next verse we're going to read has a scary dimension to it, but it's Bible. And let's read it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. What is the temple of God? Where is the temple of God anyway? What are we talking about when we talk about the temple of God? Paul's asking a question. Don't you know that you are the temple? And that thing about him whom defiles a temple, him will God destroy. I don't understand that verse, but it's a little bit scary. Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Filled with praise, filled with power, filled with glory. Filled with praise, filled with power, filled with glory. Filled with praise, filled with power, filled with glory. Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Filled with love, filled with love, the love of Jesus. Filled with love, filled with love, the love of Jesus. Filled with love, filled with love, the love of Jesus. Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am the temple. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am the temple. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am the temple. I am the temple. Sing to somebody else now. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are the temple. Sing it to them. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are the temple. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are the temple. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We are the temple. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We are the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We are the temple. We need to remind ourselves of 
of that constantly. Another verse out of Ephesians, which came to me. Ephesians 1, verses 17 and 18, Anna. Read with me. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Next verse, please. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. These next couple of songs are going to have to do with our eyes. <clears throat> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. next verse is found in Romans 12 verse 1. We're real familiar with it. Let's read it together. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is a reasonable service. We're going to do something a little out of the ordinary right now. Um, I want you to picture that there's a throne right in the middle of the platform and Jesus is sitting on it and we're going to present our bodies to him a living sacrifice as we sing this next song I'm going to encourage you to come forward and the rest of the service we're going to spend standing at the altar singing these songs and we're going to be aware of his presence as we sing it Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Come on forward, everybody. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Cities and the waste will be restored by the leading of 
church with signs and wonders marches on in one accord. The soldiers do not falter, as for him they wield the sword. His army marches, the last verse. Oh, join this mighty army, there's a battle to be won. Let us now put in the sickle, for the harvest time has come. Countless multitudes are waiting just to hear of God's own son. Moses has seen a burning bush and as he comes this is what happens read it with me and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said Moses Moses and he said here am I next verse please no 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 something something got goofed up I'm sorry but the part I wanted was take off the shoes off your feet because the place where on your standing is holy ground. I don't know what I, what I did wrong there, but um, the place where on now standing is holy ground. You're standing on holy ground right now. This is holy ground. We're standing on.
references and go to Psalm 103 verses 1 through 5 with me bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the Lord O my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgiveth all thine iniquities who healeth all thy diseases who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle's bless.
First Peter says, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, for it is written, I am holy, so be ye holy. God bless you, holy saints of God. You may return to your seats, greet somebody on the way. If you enjoy this program, we'd love to hear from you. Comments can be sent to us online or write to us at the address on your screen. imagine that there's a big box on stage, a big huge box. Can you imagine there's a big huge box up here? And what you just did is way outside that box. Amen? Amen. That's outside the box. That's not what we come for Sunday morning. We don't usually come up front. But you know what? I, I, I just want, I'd love to hear your conversation when you go to work tomorrow. You say, well, how was church yesterday? Oh, it was good. It was different. It was good. You know what? Church should be different. If nothing else, it should be different. We come to worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. And that's what we come for. I don't really care whether we're standing up front, whether we're sitting in the back corner. We come to worship the Lord. So, Barry, thank you for sharing your gifts and your talents with the, with the body of Christ. Thank you for that. I, and, and just so that, yeah, you know what? That's the Lord. God, I mean... It, for me, it was like a, a, a going and watching. A, it just reminded me of my youth 30 years ago. Plus. <laughs> 30, you know what? It just reminds me of my youth. That's, thank you very much. Just want to thank you. We, we have um, some announcements someplace. I'm just all disheveled this morning. Can't find anything. If somebody's got a bulletin. I'd really like to take a look at it. We have, uh, we'd have, like to have our ushers come forward. First of all, we're going to receive our morning offering. And uh, John Eiley, would you go back and help Kristen, please? We're going to prepare for our offering here. Let me read through the announcements this morning. Um, just a couple of things. Tomorrow is Veterans Day. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit this morning about Veterans Day. But, um, man, tomorrow's Veterans Day. Remember a veteran. If you know a veteran, I, I would encourage you to call them and thank, thank them for their service to our country. We don't often remember um, veterans or we don't pay much attention. We just grab hold of the holiday aspect of it and, and don't really pay much attention to why we do it. Also, Tuesday night is our Victory Over the Darkness class. Again, that is open right up until the very end. If you just get the opportunity to come once, I'd encourage you to come and be a part of that class uh, at 7 o'clock. And um, let's, let's take our offering this morning. Father, we thank you for the gifts that you've given us. We thank you for the resources that you've provided for us as a church, as a people. Thank you for jobs that we have. Your word declares, Father, that you're the one who gives us the ability to gain wealth. So this morning as we give, God, we just, we give to you. It's not about giving to the church. It's about giving back what you've given to us and pouring back into your kingdom. Help us, Father, as a church to wisely be able to Use this money to further your kingdom. Bless the gift and the giver today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It just, it brings a smile across my face. You know the Bible says that when we give, God gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's how he pours back into our life with peace and with joy. So give unto the Lord this morning. A couple of baby showers there on the back page. Uh, there's a baby shower for Carolyn Warren, and then um, which will be at uh, Cassie Yoder's house at 5:30. You can call Cassie and get directions if you need to. Also, uh, Saturday, November 30th, there is a baby shower for Allie Jo Prine uh, here at the church at one o'clock. That would be uh, Linda and Lonnie's granddaughter. Um, please uh, just just take note of what's going on in the bulletin and. Uh, participate in those things that are available for us. This morning for Veterans Day, 
we do have a video that I'd like to show just as a tribute to veterans. So if we're ready back there, I'd just like to show this video. The eleventh hour does not strike on the clock of every man. For at this time, most of us can be found at home, comfortable, knowing tomorrow is right on its way. At the eleventh hour, most of us can be found in our beds. But in another world, our men and our women, our brothers and our sisters, live in this hour. Tick, 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 tick. Every second for you. Every second for me. So it was on the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month of 1918. The guns were lowered. The trenches grew silent. And an armistice was declared between the Allied nations and Germany. A great war hushed so that the wives, the children, the fathers and the mothers could salute back across the ocean. And it is on this day each year that we have stopped to salute our veterans, our men and women of the 11th hour. So today, it's our turn. It's our turn to show our gratitude it's our turn to applaud when they stand. It's our turn to thank God for you. Yes, it's our turn to say thank you for going in our stay. World War I was known as the Great War. It officially ended when the Treaty of Versailles was signed June 28, 1919 in the Palace of Versailles, outside of the town of Versailles, France. However, fighting had ceased seven months earlier when an armistice was signed, a temporary secession of hostilities between the Allied nations and Germany. It went into effect and the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And for that reason, November 11th, 1918, is regarded as the end of the war to end all wars. And we know that that really didn't happen. There are still wars that go on. In November of 1919, President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed November 11th as the first commemorative of Armistice Day, and he wrote these following words, and I want you to hear these words. To us in America, the reflections of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride and heroism of those who died in this country's service and with gratitude for the victory, both because of the things from which it has freed us and because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the Council of Nations. Wilson realized that the end of that war was not just about freedom that we had, but also the freedom that we have to move forward. The original concept of this day was observances with 
parades and public meeting and actually even a brief suspension of business at 11 o'clock in the morning. Most businesses at this time of day actually stopped doing business to remember and to honor veterans, people who had served to provide our freedom. Veterans Day continues to be observed on November 11th, regardless of what day of the week it falls on. And it is designed or it is set up to not only help us preserve the historical significance of that day, but to help us focus our intention, our attention on the fact that brothers and sisters gave their lives on our behalf, a celebration to honor Americans' veterans for their patriotism, for their love of country, and for their willingness to serve and to sacrifice for the common good. You may say, you know what, Pastor, I don't believe in war. This isn't about believing in war or not believing in war. This isn't about Republicans or Democrats. This isn't about whether we it's not about any of that. It's about the fact that somebody stood in our place. It's really a picture of what Christ did on our behalf, but somebody stood in our place, and they fought for us. And some people gave their lives for us. I don't think we'll know I'm not sure that we can feel necessarily what some of those vets felt. Losing brothers at arms that stood alongside them. I've talked to some veterans who talk about standing in a trench with 30 or 50 or 100 men and in just a matter of seconds two, three, four, ten of them are gone around you. And the pain that those veterans feel and have felt. And they did that so that we can have freedom. So this morning, I'm just going to ask men and women who've served in our armed forces, if you'd please stand. We just want to honor you and thank you for your service to our country. pray for those men and women. Father, I thank you for these men and women in our congregation who have served. I know, God, that there are more who are not here with us today, but, God, they've served to protect our nation. Some of them have felt the true loss of people around them. Some of them have maybe not experienced that. But, God, I pray that you would honor them. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would heal memories. I pray that you would heal wounds. I pray that you would preserve them, God, that you would speak life over them. Father, we pray for our troops right now, men and women who are overseas, standing in the gap for our nation. We thank you, Father, that there are men and women who are willing to, at this point in time, volunteer. They sign up. They're not drafted. They sign up. And God, I ask you to protect them. I ask you, Father, to heal. Lord, we hear in the news all the time about men and women who come back from overseas and they deal with all kinds of struggles and difficulties that we don't realize. And I pray that you would heal and you'd touch them and bring life to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for your service. Today is also... International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. We don't often think about people not being able to hold a church service. I read a book by a young man whose name is David Platt. 
you hear that? I just said a young man. So a guy younger than me wrote a book. It's a young man. And he talked about when he was in China, I believe it was. The picture that he painted was, was really amazing. He talked about everybody that they would, when they went to church, they wore dark clothing, usually with a hood. And they would walk, and, and as one guy would, would lead, would go through the town, would go through wherever, people would come out and they would start following him, and they didn't even look up. All they did was they watched his shoes. They watched the person in front of him, and they followed. And they all kept their head down, and they walked, and they walked, and they walked, and people followed in just in a line. It was at night. They would start often uh, in the evening dark. It was... You know, sometimes 11, 12 o'clock, they would go till 5 or 6 in the morning. They would, you want to talk about a church service outside of the box. They sat, huddled around one light or a candle so that somebody could read the scriptures and could talk to them about Christ because they were a persecuted church. There are people around the world today that will lose their lives because of following Christ. We don't understand that. We don't get that truth. We don't see that here in the United States. But today is that international day of prayer for the persecuted church. So one more time this morning. Let's just close our eyes and lift our hearts and pray for those people. God, your church around the world is part of us. We're part of the church. We're one of another. And we don't see, we don't feel, we don't recognize what that church goes through, what that portion of your body goes through, people who literally give their lives to follow you. Today, God, I just pray courage for that persecuted church. I pray courage. I just heard the story the other day of a pastor who was captured and he is beaten daily for his faith. His wife had to flee the country. He was told that all he needs to do is renounce Christ. And he has been beaten for months every day. God, we don't even begin to understand what that looks like. But I pray hope over your church. I pray life, God, over that persecuted church, over our brothers and sisters. Help us to remember them on a daily basis. Help us to focus on praying for your body, praying for those believers that are around the globe that give their lives every day to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. A little bit of a different morning, hey? It's okay. Have you ever seen the uh, advertising tactic that's used around us, the before and after pictures? How many of you have seen before and after pictures in the news? Usually has to do with weight loss, right? They take some guy who is, I don't know, probably 15 pounds overweight, and they use one of those lenses that shows him shorter and dumpier than he is. And then four seconds later, after they talk about their miracle product, they show this guy that's just ripped. He's got six-pack abs, and he's standing there, and he's all... You've seen the before and after. I've seen before and after pictures of cars, car restoration, businesses that do car restoration. And in the before picture, they'll show like a 1970 Pinto. And in the after, they're showing a GTO. You know, it's like you got this little Pinto and you got all that muscle over there. They kind of get a little carried away. Before and after pictures. You see it on houses. Companies were advertising how they do restoration on houses. They've got the, there are whole, 
whole industry, there's whole uh, shows now, uh, makeover shows with the before and after. They take absolutely the worst pictures. If you watch makeup ones, I think are almost the funniest. These poor ladies, why would they would ever subject themselves to having that first picture put on national TV is beyond me. I mean, their eyes are just all like blotchy. It's, you had to, somebody had to beat them up the night before just to get them to look like that. And then along comes Mary Kay or some other thing that's just going to, whoo, just going to change their life. Before and after picture. You've seen those, right? Don't ever go online and just look for before and after pictures and because it, oh, shut that page. It wasn't, wasn't good. So I was going to get a bunch of pictures, but we do these before and after and they take the most... The, the worst possible picture that they have, then they put the most flattering picture. And the goal, of course, is to get you to spend your money on this assumption that you can purchase for $2.98 this improvement, this thing that's going to absolutely change your life. And the truth of the matter is, that's not generally what happens. You've usually been duped. As we're looking through the book of Ephesians, Paul gives us one of these before and after scenarios. The only difference is, Paul's is real. That's the difference. I think advertising, maybe there was a Christian along the way who said, hey, look at Ephesians chapter 2, let's try that model. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, we're going to read through verse 10 this morning. As for you, Paul says, as for you... You were dead in your transgressions and your sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath but that's one of the biggest words in scripture you know that but but because of his great love for us God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions it is by grace that you have been saved It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up in Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now I've read that verse in the last several months. We've heard that verse a number of times. As a matter of fact, as I read this first chapter, the second chapter here, I thought, you know what, God, I could probably just skip this portion because we've heard this a couple of times in the last few months. And I, I was just going to go beyond. I was going to pass over this. And I felt like the Lord kept bringing me back to it. Paul gives us this before and after picture. You've never been described like this before in your life. The first description, that Paul, first description that Paul gives us is not very flattering. In fact, it's hard to imagine it getting much worse. But Paul's first word to describe us previous to Christ is dead. You were dead. How's that for a picture? You wonder why the zombie apocalypse stuff is so really big. That's what we were. We were dead. We, there, was, there was no life, no hope, and it cannot get much worse than that. Apart from Christ, pre-conversion state, we're dead as a result of sin. The Bible says that sin kills. It destroys. It devastates. It annihilates. Sin kills. The second part of the picture is he describes us 
as being in slavery. You were dead and you're a slave. The word slavery doesn't actually appear there, but it's kind of that sense. We were following the world. Verse 2 says, we were following the devil at work in those who are disobedient in our slavery to our own cravings. The picture that's being painted here is that we are subject to the control of, our, of cravings. We, we can't get beyond those cravings. That's what we're subject to. We're enslaved by them. Oh, pastor, I think maybe that's a little bit extreme. Don't you think that's a little bit extreme? I mean, I don't know if I was really enslaved. I wasn't really, you know, a slave to those things, really. The Bible says that we are, and I think we could go through most of our... If you've ever struggled with any kind of addiction you'll know that you were a slave. You did not have a choice. That's, the Bible says we were dead and we were slaves. That's kind of the before picture. Paul says here that there are some, some pictures, some things that describe that sinful nature. One of the things he talks about is the world, our environment, our culture. How many of you know or do you believe that our culture works against God to keep us in sin? Does any, do you believe that our culture works against us? Our culture does work against us. It's the world system. And you say, well, I don't know if it's that bad. You name a sin, any sin, and I can give you an example of how our society glamorizes it makes it more appealing, makes it actually appear normal. Our society works against that. If you want to say, well, okay, what about the sin of, of lust or the sin about, of, of uh, lust? Any billboard. Drive down the highway, you will, in a very short order, run across some very scantily clad person on a billboard. That be, oh, boy, look at that. That aftershave is really going to make me... Some of the new Axe commercials, for example. People rolling down hills, falling after guys who are wearing this aftershave. Greed. Our economy is built. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. I was watching a commercial the other night, watching TV, and a guy is sitting there, and all of a sudden this dark figure shows up. And they're on a billboard there. The guys are putting up the billboard and they're rolling this picture up and it's of a car. And this, this dark figure says, you know, I can get that for you and all the things that go along with it. And all of a sudden this guy, in his mind, you know, he spins the car around and there's some hot girl that comes out and, and he does this and he's got movie stars pointing at him. Hey, and he's driving along and there's a Ferrari and, and he takes this car and he passes a Ferrari. It's like all of that stuff it reminded me of Jesus in the wilderness and the devil tempting him. It's really what it reminded me of. And then the price shows up, $29.95, $29,995. And he's like, Oh, I think I can handle this on my own. And the devil disappears. And it's like, man, that kind of wraps up all those things in one shot. All those things that we're addicted to, that we have to have. Anger, jealousy, pride, self-centeredness. I don't, you look at TV shows. You look at self-help books. There's, there's all kinds of things that actually glamorize if you watch any quote unquote reality show I can't hardly even stomach what and you know what I don't think we should be able to stomach them to be quite honest some of these things are people just finding ways to throw up all over you is what it seems like to me but our society wants to glorify that stuff and glamorize it and more than that or probably worse than that is to say that it's normal so it's okay it is okay. It's fine. Everybody does this. Everybody does it. Mike, if Sue decides that she wants to go off, it, it's fine. You just got to love on her, man. It's, it's all good. You don't got to worry about that. 
You know, if he wants to have some big flashy car that's going to put you in debt for the next 300 years, that's okay. He needs that. That helps him feel like a man. And Gladys, that perfume that you got red, I mean, brother, gals, just all over him because of that. You know, it's just, it's just, it's okay though. It's not only okay, it's desirable. This is what we want. This is what everybody lives for. It's okay. Go ahead and spend $300 on a pair of shoes or $600 on a pair of blue jeans. That's okay because welfare will cover your food bill. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Now we're stepping on toes. It's okay. Go ahead and follow after that because somebody will cover for you. We live in a culture that wants to drag us away from God. You say, well, I don't know. I haven't really, really, really seen it that way. Barry shared part of a verse in Romans chapter uh, 12, verse 1. The second half of that is chapter 2, or uh, chapter 12, verse 2. It's a very familiar verse. NIV says, Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Phillips translation says it a little bit different. Listen to what the Phillips translation says. Do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. Do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. Your life should look different because of Christ. Dave Ramsey says it this way. You need to live like no one else now so that you can live like no one else later. A friend of mine at American Linen, he's passed on now. When he was in his late 50s, he went to buy a car and he didn't have the money to buy a car. And so he, he was going to hold off and the salesman convinced him that he needed to go out and take a loan for this car. He said, and, and my friend told me, he said, I don't have, I have, I've never had any debt in my life. I've never had any debt. And the guy said, that's un-American. When this guy retired at age 65, he told me, I'm the most American guy I know now. He got started down that trail and he financed and financed and financed and refinanced. My father-in-law, whom most of you know, my father-in-law told me one time, he borrowed money from somebody, now probably 60 years ago, he said, it's the only time I ever borrowed money from anybody in my life and I couldn't sleep for three weeks until I paid it back. He didn't allow the world to conform him, to squeeze him into that box. He said, no, if I can't pay for it, I don't get it. That's the way it is. And you know what? He's not in bondage to that. My, trust me, my father-in-law is not in bondage to conformity. He just is not. They left their house one time, and, and I probably shouldn't tell on them, but I'm going to. My mother-in-law finally talked to me, you know, we should lock the house. And he couldn't figure out how to do that. They had never locked the door, so he put a padlock on the outside. So that's how they lock their doors. <laughs> a padlock, when they come home, they unlock it and they use it again. That's, that's not conformity, folks. That is not being so consumed by that stuff around us. But our world wants us to be conformed to that image. But Paul says that image is death, it's dead. So we have the world around us and we have the devil. You know, the book of Ephesians talks more about the spiritual realm and forces than probably any other book in the New Testament. Paul mentions it here and he describes this demonic realm as the rulers of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient. We've heard the phrase, the devil made me do it. Anybody ever heard that phrase? Anybody ever used that phrase? Yeah, okay, you can admit it. It's, we've all used it. Guess what? You can use that phrase all you want to. It is no excuse for your behavior. That behavior still came out of your own volition. It still came out of your own will. You still chose to do it. And so did I. Well, the devil made me do it. No, 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 no. The devil may have led me down that road. The devil may have opened my eyes to it. The devil may have suggested it. But I stepped in it myself. 
I did it myself. I get very frustrated when men talk about women and say, well, you know, it's all their clothes that made them, blah, 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 blah. You know what? You still stepped in it yourself. Okay? Stand up and take, take your own responsibility for that. We, we can't go there. So we have an enemy who wants to lead us. And he's working to keep us from God. You believe that there's an enemy out there that's working to keep us from God. We have a world system that wants to keep us from God. And we have a devil that wants to keep us from God. You don't got to believe that, but that's the truth. That's what God's word says. The third thing that we have is the flesh. The Bible talks about the lust of the flesh. You know the problem with the flesh? You can go to every revival service you want to go. You still can't cast out the flesh. The flesh is still the flesh. We don't get to cast it out. What we have to do is we have to conquer it. We have to defeat it. We have to say, you know what? I'm, we have to take every thought captive and say, whoop, not going there. Not going there. Whoop, walls up, not going there. Our culture defines freedom as the ability to do whatever we want. How many of you know that that leads us into bondage? That's not real freedom. Because it goes counter to what God has for us. The ability to do what we want, that's not freedom. That leads us into bondage. You ask again, anyone who's ever struggled with an addiction, you start out by doing what you want. And at the end, you can't give it up. You can't get rid of it. You can't escape it. It's like you've got this dark force hanging on your back, and the reality is, you do. We have subject ourselves to it. All three of those things, I believe, conspire to keep us from God. And we need to confront each one of them when we talk about living a life of holiness. Barry had no idea he was going to talk about holy this, this morning. I had no idea he was going to sing about holy, holy, holy. But we're supposed to live lives that are removed from that worldly influence. The Bible says that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're going to be around that stuff. You can't deny it. We can't live in some little community off to the side where nobody ever touches us because we're all, we, you know, we're perfect here. That's not going to work. We're in the world. That junk is around us. I had a friend one time who came to me and he, he was working at a, one of the best jobs you could get in the Hibbing area. Okay? He was working in a mine. This was 30 years ago and he was making $50,000. And he came to me and he quit his job. And I said, well, why did you quit your job? He said, oh, those people just swear so much. Now, if you're working in a church and everybody's swearing, I would probably suggest quitting. <laughs> but when you're working a job in the world and people are swearing, what do you expect? Yeah, people swear out there. They do. It, they really do. It does happen. Maybe that's not where you work, but it does happen. We want to, to isolate ourselves. You know, we can't remove ourselves from all of that worldly influence, but what we do is we stand up to it. We stand up and say, we're not going to go that way. That is not who we are. Paul kind of sums up this picture. And, and he says, this, you, you need, you, you need to, to stand up to that stuff. Those are the influences. Of, that's what you were before Christ. Before Christ, that's who we are. So again, we don't just get to pick up one thing and say, well, that's, that's, that's who we were. That's, uh, that's, that's what we wanted. It, it might be an uncomfortable descriptor, but the other thing that Paul talks about there is he says, before Christ, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about that fact? Before Christ, without Christ... We are objects of God's wrath. And I point this out for a reason. I point this out for a reason. Our old self, our old nature, prior to coming to Christ, 
we were in a very helpless place. And that word wrath is a strong word. What it means is God's holy anger against sin. That's what it literally means. Wrath is God's holy, his righteous, his justified anger against sin and the judgment that results. Paul uses that to describe us before Christ. And here's why I mention it. You say, well, pastor, I go to church. I'm here. I've accepted Christ. It doesn't make any difference for me anymore. The reason I mention it is because we have friends and family members and neighbors who have not yet accepted Christ. And we love on them and we reach out to them. And we have fellowship with them and we talk to them. But we forget. We forget that God's wrath is against them. They're objects. They're still in that place where they're objects of God's wrath. If they were to pass away without Christ, they're objects of God's God's wrath. We forget that. And when we forget that, we forget that that we have this need to live our lives in such a way that we portray Christ, that we project Christ, that, that we're living with hope, that we're living with life, that we're living with, that we're living with, we have something to offer. Do you, okay, let me give you one of my greatest frustrations. Are you ready? Eh, you might not be. You might not be. Here's one of my greatest frustrations. We've been talking about this at church, forgetting who they are. One of my greatest frustrations as a pastor, and maybe just as a Christian, is that we surround ourselves, we come to church, we surround ourselves with Christians, and then we get mad about this or we get mad about that, and we let that old junk come up. And after I know Mike and Sue for six months, I'm going to find something about them that ticks me off. Or they're going to find something about me that ticks me off. Or I'm going to find something about Barry and Sharon. Or I'm going to find something about this person or that person. And then as the church, we go and we spew that garbage all over the place instead of loving one another. And people around us go, that's the church? And we, we say... We come to church, we say that we're here to spread the gospel of Christ, and yet we spread all kinds of junk. We, uh, I'm, you know, one of the greatest, (laughs) here we go, here we go, I might be getting ready to preach. One of the greatest struggles this church has had seems to be about music. Who cares? Who cares? Don't we just come here and sing to Jesus and say, we love you, Lord? Instead, we're just wrapped up about this and about that and all the sound this and the sound that and the guitar here and there's no blah, 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 blah. Makes me want to throw up. Whatever happened to coming here and laying down our lives and saying, you know what? We love Jesus and I hope that my relationship with Alan is so strong that if somebody speaks against him, I go, you know what? He's my brother. I love that guy. Of course he's got faults. Of course he's got flaws. He's my brother. I love him. And somebody on the outside goes, wow, man, maybe there's something real to Christianity. Instead, I jump on the same bag on a bandwagon and go, yeah, I'll tell you some other dirt about Alan. We don't belong there. We don't belong there. Church, it's time we, we become the church. The greatest problem that the church has is the church. I left my notes a long time ago. I'm not sure I'm going back. Okay? We, and I'm not saying we got a bunch of junk going on right now, but people come and they just come to give and to sacrifice and we, we're, we're bent out of shape because it sounds like this or it sounds like that or it doesn't do this or it doesn't do that. I'm, are you ready for a little bit more? Here's one more. Put another one across the bow for you, Christians. I think, here we go, I might be looking for a new job. I think 
that we have made our style of worship or our style of church an idol before God. If you don't do it our way, well, that's wrong. You know, it's got to be like this. I think we've made that garbage an idol. When that thing becomes how we do something becomes more important than the fact that we're here to serve the living God and stand together as a family. I don't care whether we're standing up front. I don't care whether we're sitting in our seats. I don't care whether we got our hands raised. I don't care whether we're sitting on our hands. It doesn't make any difference to me. Don't we come here to worship the living God? Please say yes. yes. Oh, thank you. I get another month out of this one maybe. <laughs> We're here to serve the living God. We're here to worship. We're here to stand together as brothers and sisters. I, again, I think the, probably the worst thing the church has ever done is paid quote-unquote professionals like me to get up and preach and take that responsibility away from you. Yes, that's great. Maybe I will be looking for another job. <laughs> You're the church. You're the ones we stand together. We visit each other. We come. You, do you know that we don't do that anymore? We were just talking about this the other day. We're so stinking busy, we don't even visit any, anybody anymore. We don't get in our car and drive across town and knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I brought cake. You got some time? We don't do, I don't do that. And it's my job. <laughs> or is it? Or is it? New controversy stirring in the church. Pastor starts more problems. Folks, we have people. Here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. The church gets so wrapped up in, quite honestly, stuff that doesn't make two hoots in a windstorm. We get caught up in all kinds of junk. We get whining and moaning about this and that and the other thing. And people die and go to hell because they're ob objects of God's wrath. And we're not concerned about it. We're not concerned about it. We don't talk about the wrath of God. It must be politically incorrect or something. Maybe we think we either have to talk about the judgment and the wrath and the harshness of God or the love of God. And I'll tell you what, they're part of the same package. They are part of the same package. Why do you discipline your children? It's because you love them. You don't have to choose one or the other. Well, I'm going to be a disciplinarian. Well, I'm going to love. You better do both. You cannot separate those two. I would venture to go a step farther and say that if you only discipline or if you quote unquote only love, you're doing neither. That's what the Word of God would tell you if you look in Proverbs. You're not doing either one. God's wrath and His love are not opposites. They need each other. God cannot be completely loving if He doesn't have something that He hates that robs us. That's why He hates it is because it robs from us. It destroys relationship and fellowship with Him. Know ye not, know ye not, you are a temple. Know ye not, know ye not, you are a temple. What difference does it make? I'll tell you what difference it makes. It's because if I let that junk and that garbage come into my life, it separates me from a relationship from God, and I can't walk in fellowship with Him. Here he is. He's a God who wants to make His abode with me, and I'm living in such a slimy pit that He cannot be there. He can't take it on. He can't walk in that. So you say, well, why judgment? Why judgment? Because he doesn't want me living in a pit. He wants me walking in fellowship with him. Grr. Forgiveness doesn't allow us to live like hell. Okay? 
God's forgiveness should cause us to want to follow after His holiness, after His righteousness, after His right standing. We need to grab a hold of our thought life and say, this is where we're going to go. Do you realize that if God was either that judgment or that love, if, if that wasn't, if there was not a balance there, it's, it's not, what it really is, is it's just ambivalence. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. If we don't choose to discipline our children, I'm telling you, you're living, you're parenting in this land of, uh, uh, of ambivalence. It's just, a, 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 and I don't care. You, don't, you may not think that. You may not think that, but I'm telling you, somebody's going to deal with those kids down the road. Somebody's going to have to deal discipline doom down the road. And if we don't do it when they're two and they're three and they're four, then somebody's going to do it when they're 21 and 22 and 23 and 24. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it's the truth in Christianity as well. It's the truth in Christianity. We don't think of unsaved people along those lines that they're objects of God's wrath, but that is the reality. And Christian, we need to grab a hold of that truth so we all that much more express the love of God and the love of Christ to Him instead of walking out of here today going, well, I don't know what Barry was doing up there. Have people going to the front. Yeah, that's not the way we do church in that church. I ain't never done church like that before. Hallelujah, we did something different for a change. You know, it was different, and I was uncomfortable. I didn't want to walk up to the front, and so I said, great. God bless you. I'm glad you stayed in your chair if that's what you did. It's different. At no point, at no point did I hear him worship the devil. At no point did he do that. Did he do that? I missed that. We came here to worship God. Did we worship God? Yeah. Some of us worship closer. Some of us worship farther away. Some of us had our arms folded. Some of us, you know what? Who cares? Five songs and an offering is not an idol that I think we should grab a hold of. I just don't think it is. God might move in ways some days that are incredibly solemn. He may move in a way that every one of us stands here and can't hardly even vocalize a word. And he may move in such a way someday that you want to act like the preacher and bounce up on stage. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's the way God's going to... I don't know. But neither of those should become idols for us, folks. Some of it's going to become uncomfortable. I hope, I hope that when I'm preaching a word someday you feel like, that's uncomfortable. Do you know why I hope that? Because that's what it's like when I'm preparing. Oh, God, that's uncomfortable for me. I don't like it. Pass it on. I'm just up here sharing the wealth, brother. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> Trust me, God deals with me. We, we have people around us who are they're dead, they're enslaved, they're trapped. They need someone who cares. Verse 4. Verse 4 starts out with but. Hallelujah just about the time we figure we're lost and we're gone and it's despair and there's no way to move on, Paul says, but, but, let me find it. I put my notes in the wrong order this morning. But, because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. That little word, but. Without that but, it's like there's no hope. But God. And the next three verses describe what this but God, it's the after picture. It's demonstrating that contrast, that change that takes place. The focus, all of a sudden, if you notice this, read this. Read through Ephesians chapter 2, read this. Because it starts out talking about us. And then when it says, but God, when all the good stuff happens, the good stuff happens when the focus is changed. The focus in the first three verses is all about us. It's all about us. We were bad. We were, we're, we're enemies of God, God's wrath, by the world, the devil, the flesh. That's all about us. But God... 
Paul says, change your focus, but God, once you get focused on God, things change. But God. And I said, the next three verses change this. Verse 4 places, squ- places us squarely, places our focus squarely on where it needs to be, and that's God. Paul mentions God's love and God's mercy, and each of them are emphasized with an adjective, a descriptor. And th- that descriptor is great, great love. In fact, in the original language, there is even more of an emphasis on this love of God. If we read it literally, it says, because of the great love which he has loved, with which he has loved us. So here's this, here's this Hebrew poetry. Here's this Hebrew poetry. I've talked about this before. They didn't use bold text. They didn't underline. They didn't do all that stuff. So if, if they really wanted to let you know that something was important, they repeated it. Paul repeated it. That's why he said, grab a hold of it, he says. This because of this great love which he has loved us, with which he has loved us, and is rich in mercy. There are two amazing characteristics of God. He has made us alive because of that. We were dead, now we're alive. That is our testimony. Our testimony is not how good church was or how bad church was. Our testimony is that we were dead and now we're alive. There was no hope. Now we're filled with hope. We had nothing to offer and now we have something to offer. That's the life. That's the hope. There's more here. And we're out of time this morning. God has raised us up in Christ And he has seated us in the heavenly realms. And that is his picture of us. That's how he sees us. Next week, I'm going to focus on verse 10. I'm going to actually issue a challenge to you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. If you do not have that verse committed to memory, I'm going to ask you by next Sunday to have that verse committed to memory. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We're going to spend the whole day, the whole time that I have on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The whole time. One verse. We'll look at other verses that build into it. But I'm telling you, we're going to spend the whole time talking about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Commit that verse to memory by next week. Because I'm telling you, there's so much in that verse about who we are in Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your life. I thank you for your hope. I thank you that we don't need to remain dead. I thank you, God, that there is life and hope and life in abundance as soon as we take our focus off of us and the focus is placed on you. God, I pray that this week you will remind us, you will remind us, you will keep in front of us, keep in front of our face daily that the people that are around us that do not know you are subject to your wrath. God, build the heart of compassion in us. Take our eyes off of us and build a heart of compassion in us for people that are around us. Doesn't mean we have to get weird. Doesn't mean we have to go and beat them up with a Bible. Doesn't mean we have to do all kinds of things. But it does mean that we need to focus our lives around you in order to bring hope. In order to bring change. In order to see the reality of your body come to life in this community. God, I believe you want to do something different in this community, and I believe that you're going to use your body to do it. Hallelujah, Father. God, I just pronounce blessing over this congregation of people. I pray that you would pour into their lives in huge ways. In Jesus' name. Folks, I just think that what God has for his church, if it's not about us coming to church, It's about us being the church. And when we make that transition, when that transition happens, you're going to see life, you're going to see light, you're going to see things happen around you, and you're going to go, wow, wow, 
Wow, I just thought, wow, I just talked to that guy, and the next thing you know, I'm praying for him. Look at that. Because it's not about us going to church, it's about us being the church. Amen. I could keep on preaching, but I'm gonna let you go. <laughs> Have a great week. Memorize Ephesians 2:10. Bless you. Thanks for joining us for today's broadcast. You are also invited to join us in person Sunday mornings at 10:30 a.m. Viewers like you help to make this program possible. If you'd like to help, send your tax-deductible contributions to the address on your screen or give online at cfcdl.org. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, we'd love to hear from you. Comments can be sent to us online or write to us at the address on your screen. Thanks again for joining us. See you next week 